Here. Hi everyone. Thank you all so much for coming out and spending your Wednesday evening here with us. My name is Amali and I'm the events director here at Books and Magic. We are so excited to have Lori Moore, Susanna Moore, and Taylor Antrim with us tonight to discuss all things The Lost Wife and I am homeless if this is not my home. But before you get into all of that, I just have a few logistics to point out for how tonight's event is going to go. Uh, first off, mask wearing is optional at tonight's event, but if you'd like an extra mask, we have plenty up at the front register where you checked in. We will be doing a hand-raised audience Q&A towards the end of the discussion, so please start thinking of questions to ask and hold on to them. After the talk tonight, Lori and Susanna will be signing and personalizing books at the front next to where you checked in. We'll let you know where and when to start lining up for that. And lastly, if you're joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we would love to encourage you to buy a copy of I Am Homeless If This Is Not My Home and The Lost Wife online using the link in the live stream description. All right, let's get into this. We've got two books to talk about, so I'll try to do it quickly. Um, both of these novels follow their protagonists on a journey, examining how they deal with love, grief, and survival. In The Lost Wife, Sarah travels from Rhode Island to Minnesota in, in the hopes of reconnecting with her best friend. However, when she discovers upon arrival that her friend has died, she must redirect her path. In I Am Homeless If This Is Not My Home, Finn drops everything, his job, his brother in hospice care, to drive from New York to Illinois when he receives news that his ex-girlfriend Lily is in trouble. Of course, he also arrives too late and finds her already buried in an unmarked grave. But as any good ex-boyfriend does, he digs her up, loads her decaying corpse in his car, and embarks on a road trip to a body farm in Tennessee. We cannot wait to hear what more these two wonderful authors have to say about life and love and what to do when your ex-girlfriend's face is falling off. <laughs> Lori Moore is the Gertrude Conway Vanderbilt Professor of English at Vanderbilt University. She is the recipient of a Lannan Foundation Fellowship and is a member of the American Academy Art of Arts and Letters. She lives in Nashville, Tennessee. Susanna Moore is the author of the novels, The Life of the Objects, The Big Girls, One Last Look, In the Cut, Sleeping Beauties, The Whiteness of Bones, and My Old Sweetheart, and two books of nonfiction, I Myself Have Seen It, The Myth of Hawaii, and Paradise of, of the Pacific, Approaching Hawaii. She lives in Hawaii and teaches at Princeton University. As I mentioned earlier, Taylor Antrim joins, um, or will be moderating, moderating tonight's conversation. Taylor is the deputy, deputy editor at Vogue and the author of two novels, Immunity and The Headmaster Ritual. All right, that's all for me. Without any further delay, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Taylor, Lori, and Susanna. Thank you so much. I'm moderating this, so I, I will start very briefly and say it's such an honor to be here with these two wonderful writers. And I think our format is that um, each of you are going to read briefly from your books. Yes. And we have a batting order. Are you first, Lori? Okay. Yeah, I guess I'm going first. Yes. Okay. So. Um, okay. Let's do it. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for coming. I have to say, Taylor's the only one up here who's we haven't established a bloodline with. Right? <laughs> but Susanna and I, we established long ago, our, we're first cousins 17 times removed. <laughs> that close. We're so close. Um, okay, hang on a second. The problem with reading from a novel, of course, is you sort of have to set it up a little bit. Um, okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to read from the part where Finn, who is really the main character, the protagonist, and the controlling consciousness of the novel, is summoned um, back to his town in Illinois because something is up with his ex-girlfriend. And so her friend, Sigrid, has called him. And so he's reporting in to Sigrid to sort of 
find out what's happened. And Sigrid is head of their book group and also the wife of the the headmaster. That doesn't matter. That does. It doesn't matter. Um, okay. Finn knocked on the door and rang the bell both. One obeys, one's doom. Thank you for coming, Sigrid said, closing the door behind him. He left his coat on. She hadn't offered to take it. I almost missed the house, he said. Didn't you used to have a big tree out front? It got old, Sigrid said, and then there was a storm. What has happened, he asked now, getting to the point. You may want to sit down. Oh my God, said Finn. He sank down on the couch, his coat still on. The room, the white built-in bookcases, the hardcover books, the Mexican art, the new Mexican art, the one Picasso print whose black lines match the wrought iron railing on the staircase in the corner, the furniture in shades called Dawn and Pete, like one's very own friends from elementary school. He had once thought such a jacked up, bespoke loving home would have cured everything, but he and Lily would have only brought their own difficult and undissected unhappiness into every room. The ladies of the club met here each Tuesday night. He now sensed hate and witchiness and emptiness, not even his or even theirs, but that of the universe, which had somehow gotten in and was swirling around. It shone around the absent ladies in whatever the opposite of a halo was, even though the ladies of the group had not yet arrived. The group is not coming tonight, said Sigrid. Okay. <clears throat> Lily has finally done it, Sigrid said. Oh my God, Finn babbled again. He dropped his face into his hands. She had taken a turn, Sigrid said, and was not doing well. Finn pulled his hands away. He knew Lily like the backs of them. That is, he never looked closely too busy reading his own palm. But he had loved her always in that necessary twisted hurting way. The actual end of her though, he had, ma he had imagined it. He hadn't actually imagined thor thoroughly. How, how? His tears became icicles now frozen mid drip. As I said, she was not doing well. Why wasn't she in a hospital, he asked. She was, said Sigrid, Jack took her there, but. Once she was there, she refused to have visitors. But how did she get out? She didn't, said Sigrid. The doctors wouldn't allow it. Finn didn't know why this had been turned into a guessing game. It caused him to stand, his coat still on. She jumped from the roof, he said. No. He pulled his coat tightly around him. She seduced the doctor in order to get his belt. He wasn't actually sure he said this aloud. Perhaps he did. For years, he had cleared her closets when she accumulated too many belts, their buckles like the stark hissing mouths of snakes. So how could she die, he asked. There was a long silence. He sat back down. How could she have died? They watch you like hawks in there, he said. They take away everything, any accessory to death. There aren't even curtains, not a shoelace or an earring or a hoodie string. Perhaps she hadn't died. She'd staged it somehow to escape. He would find her. She would know that. She would know how to do that. And this was the signal that she was counting on him to find her. Sigrid cleared her throat. The shower, she said. But they don't allow you to have anything in the shower, said Finn. Soap on a rope, I don't think so. And there was always a guard at the door. She wanted to die, said Sigrid. Yes, said Finn. The guard can only do so much, continued Sigrid. They often have their backs turned out of a small sense of privacy. What do you mean? Lily wanted very badly to die, Sigrid repeated. How well he had understood this through the years. Very little on God's earth could entice Lily into wanting for long to stay on it even dressed as a clown as she cheered on others to embrace life with laughter. Her doctors were useless, Finn said. They all should have been set on fire in a public square. Statements such as this were why Finn had no friends who were doctors. <laughs> Thank you.
Hello. I'm going to read um, now from the beginning, which I usually do, um, but from a little way in. The narrator is a young woman called Sarah Brinton, who is married to Dr. John Brinton, who is the resident physician at an Indian um, agency, the Yellow River Agency in the new state of Minnesota, attending the Sioux tribes encamped on either side of the river. And the year is 1862. The braves are tall and handsome with strong beaked noses, their black eyes set wide in their long faces. They are lanky and erect, proud of bearing, quick to take offense and quick to laugh. They pride themselves in maintaining a blank expression, their wishes conveyed by a forceful gesture rather than speech, which frightened me at first. I sense that despite their reserve, they are emotional, even volatile. I often hear them laughing. I suspect about us. <clears throat> they are without beards or any hair that I can see except eyebrows and what is on their heads, where it is sometimes bound with red cloth and sometimes twisted into a top knot tied with feathers and coins. Sometimes they rub soot on their hair to darken it. Any hair on the face or the body is removed using hinged muscle shells from the river. Some of them wear striped turbans made from cloth sold by the traders, which they pierce with feathers. Others wear roaches of horsehair or porcupine quills dyed red with buffalo berries attached to their heads with leather straps. To my surprise, the white tubular ornaments known as hair pipes and which they string as necklaces come from all places, New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> a blanket is fastened at the left shoulder and tucked under the right arm to leave one arm free. Their deerskin leggings reach to the thigh, <clears throat> attached to a waistband by thin straps or held by garters tied at the knee. Flaps at the bottom of their leggings are tucked under each foot. They sometimes wear only a breech cloth, a long strip of tan deer skin looped between their legs and fastened at the waist. In the back, there is little more than a string between their buttocks, and when a man bends over, he might as well be naked. I notice that the white women, including myself, try not to stare, afraid of what they might see. Sometimes I must force myself to look away. The women are winsome, especially when young and before they have been worn by work, never raising their eyes, their heads lowered. Their legs are unusually long, which makes them appear short-waisted. They hold the edge of their robes to their mouths when they speak, which makes it difficult to hear them. Many of the old women are bent nearly in two, having for years carried heavy burdens with straps placed across their foreheads. Both the men and women have black tattoos of animals and stick figures and mysterious geometric designs, and some have two blue lines tattooed down their chins so that when they die, the owl maker will not chase them from the ghost road. On the older men and women, the tattoos are faded as if the dye has seeped deep into their skin. The women were the first to come to the house, cautious and silent, and I engaged three of them. There are now eight Dakota women with me throughout the day. They have taught me to make pemmican, which I find most delicious, although I am convinced no white person can prepare it properly and they have shown me the way to coax a smoky lavender dye from the blue paper cones used to wrap sugar. They bring me branches of juniper to burn when the wind is from the north and the stink of the piggery is strong and baskets of wild plums more succulent than peaches and I give them flour and beef and eggs. There is cooking to be done and canning and the butchering and smoking of fish and pork and game and laundry to be washed and pressed 
My husband is particular about his clothes. The women sew and cook for me, which is considered corrupting. Not that they are given work, but because I pay them. I must admit, I like getting into a made bed. My life is one of ease now. I am warm in the winter, never hungry, with the luxury of a bathtub and a clean privy. I have servants. I'm gentry now. Who would have thought it? Our house is dark inside, not only because of the mahogany furniture his mother has sent us, but because the Sisseton like to stand at the windows, sometimes two or three deep, to watch us, chatting about us in Dakota and laughing at us, sometimes uproariously. When they are not at the windows, they come inside without knocking or invitation to ask for food or simply to keep us company. They like to twine James's pale hair between their fingers, amused by his curls and by his fearlessness, which they esteem even more than his hair. As the Sioux know no recourse for their wrongs but war, their humiliation makes for the sense of danger I cannot help but feel, present just beneath the surface, waiting to erupt. It's also possible that I exaggerate and have nothing to fear. Still, I am ill at ease around the men. I am convinced that the locks of hair decorating their shirts and leggings are the hair of people they have killed. The amused women tell me that the hair is their own, woven for the most honored of the braves by their mothers and sisters, but I do not believe them. Dr. Brinton, who knows about such things, says they believe that their hair is part of the soul because it continues to grow after death. If the scalp of a fellow warrior is taken, he cannot enter the land of the great spirit until, until an enemy scalp is taken in return. I tell Dr. Brinton, I don't care to know any of this. He is writing what is called a monograph on the Santee or Eastern Dakota. They are comprised of four groups. The Midovacontin, who live near us in Shakopee and are most familiar to me. The Wapaton, the Wapakuti, and the Sisseton, with whom we live now. <coughs> He says that long ago they were rice gatherers in the north until the Ojibwe drove them onto the prairie with guns given them by the French. They move camp according to the season and in pursuit of game. He admires their fearlessness, their resourcefulness, their fortitude, their way with horses, their good looks, he said with a smile not a trait necessarily required for killing buffalo. I am afraid of them for the same reasons, I said. I think we're doing a quick stage yes. <laughs> renovation. Bear with here. us for just yeah. one moment. So we, um, those were wonderful readings, thank you. We've established that you all are distantly related, but I wondered. Um, I established it. Yes, you established that, right? Um, Susan, that's not really quite going with it. No, no, I am You not. are? Okay. <laughs> no. Now I can see you. I was wondering if this is the first double bill of Moore's in a sort of literary context. How about in the world? In the world. In the world. Okay. I once was in a taxi cab with Honor Moore. Okay. And Paul Oster was sitting between us. And he said, Oh, I'm in a Moore sandwich. <laughs> and I said, No, you're in an Oster sandwich because the sandwich is always named after 
what's inside, not the bread. <laughs> Sandwich is never named after the bread. So, right, right. So there has there was that brief other thing that happened. More sandwich than that, briefly. Yeah. The Oster sandwich. I, I, I understand. I understand. We don't call it a sourdough sandwich, after all. You know honor. Yes. Yes. Um, so uh, these books have some things in common. Uh, they both have either set in the 19th century or have sequences set in the 19th century. They both include very vivid, sometimes quite disgusting journeys that um, the characters go on, and they're both quite short. Um, but I thought it would be useful to discuss them separately. And so, Gloria, I wanted to start with you. Your novel has um, a really interesting structure. It is something of a collage, to my mind. Um, we start in the 19th century with uh, letters from a, um, uh, the proprietress of a boarding house to her sister, and then we move ahead to 2016. And uh, it, anyway, the, the structure of it made me wonder where you started. Did you, <laughs> did you start in the 19th century? Did you start in 2016? Um, where did it begin? I think I started writing, it, I, I started the 19th century part um, in 2016. <laughs> That's kind of the so I, um, so yes and yes. Um, but what I had, what I, you know, I wanted to match up these times a little bit, but not in a very close way. But I wanted th these two um, periods of time to sort of talk to each other because I thought they sort of were talking to each other. But I, I was doing research at the New York Public Library. You must have done a lot of research, too, for years. Um, and I did too much research. I, I couldn't use most of it. But, um, but as you know, the letters are part of a document that the character in 2016 actually has. Mm -hmm. So the, the letters are sort and the first section of the novel is sort of spilling out or bursting out of the more contemporary part and sort of infiltrating it. Mm -hmm. But it begins there, so it's a little confusing. Um, speaking of research, there are yeah. uh, very vivid descriptions of a dead body. Um, and I mm. wondered if you spent any time with one in the course of writing this. Actually, no. That's not the part I researched. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just, I was just winging it. I was just inventing a lot. But that, you can, that's easy to do. Are you a fan of the zombie tip genre? I wondered if I wondered that no, too. No, should I have should I have read more in that? <laughs> it's not too Did late. I get things wrong? It's not too late. <laughs> I didn't I didn't want it to be a conventional zombie. Of course not. So I had to make it all up myself. But um, I just I just was imagining mm -hmm. what it might look like. I mean I you know, everyone has seen someone who's sick and who's not doing well. So you just go from there. <laughs> um, Suzanne, I, I assumed I understood where you, where you began with your your novel, and it would be with the character, the historical figure of Sarah Wakefield. So, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about her and what interested you about her. Um, and I also wondered what parts of her story did you want to fill in, because I understand that, that you have, you know, added more to her story than than we know from the record. Uh, I began reading a few years ago uh, what are called a genre called captivity narratives, of which there are surprisingly many. Most of them are uh, early 17th and 18th century and in the Northeast. Um, there are a few in the West that, that, that came later and in the 19th century, as logically as uh, the expansion of the country um, occurred. But I didn't think I was going to write. I, doesn't that happen to you? Are you reading something and it takes a while for you to think, oh, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe I should write about this. And what got my attention in her story, Sarah Wakefield, whose name I changed, uh, was that I, she wrote a very short, almost a pamphlet describing her captivity, her and her two children's captivity. And I didn't think she was, I didn't think she was telling the truth, 
completely um, and did not blame her for that, understood why she might not want to, having um, put herself in the position of defending the Sioux, which made her an outcast. So her little book was a way to, I think, find a way back into the society that had rejected her. So what I made up, I made up almost everything until she's captured by Indians. And then I, I uh, depended on her facts, but also then made up a lot too. But the whole, no one knew where she came from. There's been a lot written about Sarah Wakefield by feminist writers and writers of the West and also um, uh, writers about, nonfiction writers about the Sioux uprising and captivity narratives, but no one, no one, they knew she was from Rhode Island, but nothing more. And now thanks to the internet, which I almost always deplore, although <laughs> it has given me so much in the way of research, I discovered her name, the fact that she was a bigamist, that she had a child who she had abandoned and what I didn't know and what no one told me, no one could tell me, was how she fetched up in Minnesota, which when she arrived in 1855 wasn't even a state. I mean, why? If you're running away from an abusive husband, there are lots of places you can go to, but I, you know, the prairie of Minnesota is not the first place I think you would think of. So why, why? There. So I invented a friend, which, as as you know, I know that friends are always very helpful <laughs> in novels because they can ask questions and it gives you someone for your main character to talk to. Right. So I was very happy to invent um, Maddie. The journey she takes to Minnesota is quite harrowing and um, a wonderful part of the novel. So uh, that's that's so fascinating that that was a part that. Um, you really brought to the story. Um, sticking with the 19th century just for an, a, a, another moment, Laurie, um, having read you so carefully over so many years, I think of you as someone whose um, sentences are very carefully considered um, and very carefully tuned. And I had never read Laurie Moore writing in the register of a 19th century woman before. And I um, sort of delighted in that when I saw it. And I wondered if you enjoyed writing in that slightly more antique register um, yeah I did I did I did I didn't think of it as an antique register I thought of it as a character you know so once you have a character in your head mm -hmm. and you can ventriloquize her and conjure her the voice can come especially if you've been reading 19th century letters reading you know doing that kind of research reading diaries and stuff and I have been living in the south um, for nine years, and there is a way Southerners speak that is just slightly different from the way Northerners speak, mm -hmm. and so that was that that just got in there. But I could, I could very easily get to her voice. It did. I, it didn't have to go very far. Right. She was there at the beginning, and then I wrote the book exactly the way it appeared. So I, so I left her voice and went to. 2016 and did Finn's part and then I went back to her. It was very easy to go back and forth because she was she was just there as a character. But I couldn't do I couldn't give more of her story than I than I did. It just that's just the only part that would fit in this novel. But there is a contemporary innkeeper who is meant to sort of conjure her a little bit. Right, who we encounter late in the novel. Right, right, right. Um, Susanna, on on your writing, I'm I'm interested in what what I think of as a quality of, of restraint in in your writing. Or I mean, that would be my word. I um, uh, I have read people describe your work as having a, an element of detachment. You know, um, <laughs> and it, this all made me think about revision. And I thought to myself. For someone who's written such a slim, powerful novel as this one, with a sense of restraint in the language, um, are you a heavy reviser? Is this something that do you pull uh, lots of material out of your first drafts and get them into this wonderfully, you know, um, 
boiled down space or what kind of what kind of revisor are you? It, I, I don't think it is that different from the first draft, although my editor, hmm. Shelley Wanger, would at a certain point insisted on taking it away from me lest it you know, become 12 pages. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do tend to take things out, but I, I, I don't think I took out too much. It, the trouble always, you know, I start with a character like you. The trouble always is, um, and I, I'm sure I make my students crazy by repeating this all the time, is that uh, the, the phrase hanging bridges, which you have certain events that occur and that you know you want to write about, and then the trick is how to join them. And the hanging bridge can be all sorts of things, steel, bamboo, rope. <laughs> um, but it has to be there. So if anything, I added hanging bridges to, so that it made sense. Um, Lori, I think of your novel as being very much um, about death. It struck me as a novel about that is thinking about afterlives of all sorts of kinds. And, um, you know, when I think about your work, uh, there have been many narratives of growing up. There have been narratives about marriage, about divorce. And then this novel seems so preoccupied with um, death and what comes after. And I guess maybe there's, is there a polite way of asking, are you interested in death right now? Oh, I thought you were going to say, does this mean you're done? <laughs> <laughs> what else is there? <laughs> What's the next book? Um, there be no next book, I guess, after that. Um, reincarnation, yeah. Um, your mic, your mic. Oh, the mic, sorry. The question is... Why death? Why death? <laughs> Everybody's interested in death. All right. Yeah, death is the great subject, and it and it was there from, you know, in all my books. There's death. Okay. There really is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's death in every book. But yeah, the question is more, why not? Why not? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> is it? She has more death. You have more death in your book than I do. Yes, I do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have sense. I'm, I, I'm taking a wrap for it. That's all right. I'll, I'll do it. Um, but no, death. Death is a great subject because it's it's you know it's it's right here for all of us. It's right next to us, and it surrounds us. And um, you know, and there's much to say about it and think about it, um, and much to imagine. Well, bringing so much humor and laughter to the subject of death, I thought was one of the gifts of yeah. your book. And I had a sense reading that um, one of the ideas is that perhaps one has more fun after one dies than one does really? while one is living. Really? It takes me to the, some, the character of Lily, for those who haven't read the book. Um, she is a decaying corpse who is the main character in the second half of the book. Alert. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. I don't think I'm trying to say it's more fun. <coughs> it's more fun to be dead than to be alive. Is that what you thought? Well, <laughs> well the, the Finn character is quite... Um, <laughs> Uh, th 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 yeah, th th there's there seems to be um, thinking about what uh, death in life looks like, and that struck me as Finn, someone who's walking around not very happy. Um, and then Lily seemed quite joyous about um, the state she was in. So that's where that comes from. I don't, I don't think, I don't think anyone's very joyous in this book. I, I think they're, you know, it's a love story, it's a ghost story. The idea that that it, you know death might be a happier, more fun place than life is really interesting, and that that will be my next book. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, they're they're being funny with each other, sorta. Of. But that they, you know, they're seeking ways to have conversations in cars, conversations that avoid big topics than conversations that go right directly to, you know, long-held issues between them. 
he's, you know, it's, it's also about mental illness to some extent. I mean, he's really trying to understand her death and cannot because it's sort of a black box. It, it, he can't, he can't get inside it. Um, and so he's angry. Um, and she has to deal with the anger and he has to deal with his anger. He's a bit of a hapless guy who's doing his best. And she is, um, she's a bit of a mystery. Mm -hmm. A mystery. Um, so I work at Vogue, and uh, Susanna, I was in the archive, um, and you've generously written several things for us over the years. Laura, you've always turned us down. I would like to say. <laughs> um, what, what did you did you What did you ever offer me? I mean, routinely, whenever um, two or three times, two or three times, I have politely inquired. You have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What were you What were you offering? <laughs> um, we can work something out. Okay. <laughs> Let's get a word rate right on the table here. Um, but uh, you spoke to a former colleague of mine uh, in an interview. Uh, I think it was two thousand. Three. And you said something which I thought was interesting. You said, what I suppose I'm interested in is just this idea of what it is to be female. You said that about your work. And I wondered if that was still true and if that informed some of the thinking and the writing in the new book. Oh, this is why I turned him down. <laughs> um, also, I wanted to say I've actually written a book written narrated by a dead person. Yes, you have. So, yes, you know, have. speaking of death, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, obviously, I'm, I'm, I keep being asked or being scolded or even criticized for not writing more um, deeply, not having a, an important male character in my books. I mean, it's, they're all women, really. So, yes, I guess I would have to say I am very interested in what it is to be female. It's a mystery. To me still you and it's even more of a mystery at what it is to be male i have to say completely incomprehensible <laughs> <laughs> people scold you for not having enough men in your in your well life? not writing a book about a male as a man as the main character why haven't you done that what's the matter you know <laughs> well i just i just did that with my this book, this new book, and I thought, this is the first time I've done it. Yeah. And I thought, men are going to love this. <laughs> <laughs> and every man who's reviewed it has hated it. <laughs> oh, my, oh my goodness. Well, there, there's, Not there are two. That, that the first two. One in the Swanee Review and one in the LA Times. But the women, women are much nicer to this book. They like this guy better than guys like this guy. <laughs> so I don't know. See, it just shows that we're sort of lost in the in the gender thing. I, I, that seems right. <laughs> Lori, I also thought um, uh, I wondered if you channeled any of your thoughts about teaching into the character of Finn. He seems quite a disgruntled <laughs> high school teacher, and I also thought um, if I thought of your um, quite viral. Uh, review of the Sally Rooney novel, <laughs> and I wondered if you got in any trouble yeah, with millennials and, and any uh, hate mail for millennials after that was published. Does everyone know what I'm talking about? She reviewed, can you tell them? Oh, well, I reviewed um, the show. Okay. Not okay, the novel. Yes. The occasion was the show, Normal People. Right. But you took on Sally Rooney as a writer, surely. No, I didn't. <laughs> don't misrepresent it. I, 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 got, I got in enough trouble. The phenomenon. I don't add to the trouble. Um, I wanted to sort of speak of because it was an adaptation of her novel. Um, I've forgotten the title of the novel. Normal people. Normal people. <laughs> Normal people. And um, so I wanted to. to Say, okay, she is like she was the first great successful millennial novelist. So I, I got a little sidetracked, and I said, "What is a millennial? And what do we think of millennials?" And then I went into what baby boomers think of millennials, because baby boomers are their parents. 
So basically it was a generational thing. And I said, I was just reporting from what other parents were saying. <laughs> I wasn't saying this personally, I was just reporting. Um, but then I went on to really, really praise the series. Right. But people got very distracted by, by that aside, that generational side. Oh yeah, we all shared it around, we loved it. The, the Gen X community really appreciated it. <laughs> <laughs> the because they were skipped over. Oh yeah, yeah, no criticism directed towards right. Gen X. Gen X <laughs> oh, we're, we're not included, yay. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, right. We enjoyed the criticism of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to leave some time for the audience and maybe we can just get to it right now, so. Um, Oh, yes. <laughs> Someone is a dominant. <laughs> <laughs> so does anyone have a question? Thank you. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <coughs> We're all ready to the Q and A in the audience. I, I think we are to the Q and A. The audience Q and A. Um, this is actually for both of you, since you're both professors. How does teaching affect your writing? Because they're both take a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you go. I go. I go. Um, <laughs> it completely obliterates it. <laughs> <laughs> you can't really do them both at the same time. It's very, very hard. Um, what do you want to add? I, I know, I agree. And I also was very relieved to stop teaching writing. Um, I now teach a seminar that doesn't really have too much. It has to do with writing, but not my students' writing. So I was very relieved um, because I, I'm not sure it's possible uh, to teach someone uh, to become a writer from scratch. So it was always a bit stressful. Um, I don't know if you felt that way, but... Well, I, I didn't think what we were doing was bringing them from scratch. I mean, usually, pe well, undergraduates you are. Yeah, see, you're teaching undergrads, and I sometimes teach undergrads. And when you teach undergrads, you're basically sort of introducing them to books to read and teaching and, them and, how to and read. And semicolons. And semicolons. <laughs> and subject verb agreement. And, yeah, and dangling modifiers. And dangling participles. And, yeah, and subjunctive clauses. And, um, yeah, sorry. Um, but, yeah, we're teaching grammar. We're teaching grammar to, sometimes even to grad students. Yeah. The grad, and they're, they, you know, the students are very impressed. They say, they say, where did you learn this? Oh, oh. And we always have to say, eighth grade. Yeah. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't learn it in eighth grade. No. So they're getting, it's not their fault. It's not their no. fault. They just well, don't learn it. It, it, all, it also comes from not, we were also readers. It yeah. comes from not reading a lot. The, the, my students have not read very much. Right. I, we're not answering your question, I don't think. <laughs> well, I'm just curious if sometimes you could be inspired by what you read or wish you had, uh, from, from your students, or wish you had. Oh, I'm always inspired by what I assign them to read. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope to bring that enthusiasm to them, and I hope they will bring it back to me. Um, but, you know, some of the students are lovely, and some of them are really bright, and some of them go on. I have some of the most amazing students, as Emma Straub can attest to. Um, and I feel like my former students are like taking over the world. One of them is now director of the program at Wisconsin. Uh, dozens of them are published writers, really successful, brilliant writers. Um, so I feel not that I've had a hand in that, I really haven't. Um, but I can, what's nice is I can pretend to. Yeah. <laughs> is that from teaching English or teaching creative writing? Creative, or both writing. creative writing. But I teach, I teach literature within the workshop yeah, you know, a little course, bit. Yeah. Yes. I, I think my classes were always about teaching them to read. Right. So. Right. So. Like maybe that answers it. What, what you have to do is use your summers wisely. That's what a teacher of mine told me. 
when I was in graduate school. He said, I just got to learn to write in the summer. I thought, oh, that's so depressing. I can't get that much done in the summer. Um, I do think if you have a year and a half off, I think I think sabbatical leave should be like a year and a half. <laughs> and then you could get something really, really done. Um, but you just, you know, you you do the best you can. Do the best you can. I, I learned from my students that there was a professor, rather well known at Princeton, who um, assigned his own work <laughs> to his students for critiquing and discussion. I was very shocked by this. Yeah, I've heard of that at other schools and programs too. I knew someone who did it just because he was teaching a lecture class and wanted to sell 300 copies <laughs> of his poetry book. Oh, oh did he? Did he? Yes, well, oh. he, they, they were made to buy it, and he, he stayed in good graces with his university press publisher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a true story. I think, but I think the students didn't mind that. I think they found it interesting to have the poet there in the room. Well, what was the delusion of intimacy when yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were really just being used? Exactly. <laughs> but that's a life lesson. <laughs> I had a question. I have actually a first comment. Um, I taught high school English many years ago with Frank McCord. Oh, and, uh, you know, after he retired, he wrote Angela's Ashes, and I right, asked him, right. what took you so long? And he said, I, I never get the class, the sounds of the classroom out of my ears. Uh, it wasn't oh. until he retired that he was able to do that, because he had many drafts of Angela's Ashes that never went anywhere. Um, I guess my question is, um, it seems like short stories are becoming less popular in the next generation, or millennials, or younger students. Do you, do you see that? Or, I mean, is there a waning of short story interest? Um, we have publishing people here in the front row. <laughs> I don't think short stories, I mean, since since the invention of television, I, don't, I think short stories have suffered tremendously. They used to be television. They used to be in magazines. They used to be entertainment. Um, and then as soon as television came along, then short stories started to become art. And as soon as it becomes literary art, it's less popular. But it's been in that condition for decades. And so it is a, I mean, it is an art form more than ever, really, the short story. Um, whether, you know, it's more commercial or less commercial, I don't know. I think, you know, those things have their ups and downs that can't be accounted for. But, you know, certainly Jhumpa Lahiri's right. collections have sold very well, and their art, they're beautiful. Um, so it just depends. Any, any literary journals you recommend for short stories that you like? Uh, the Paris Review is good. Uh, the Swanee Review sometimes has wonderful stories by people you might not have heard of before because they're young, coming up, and you know editors are looking for that. The New Yorker, it's hit or miss. Um, <laughs> you know that's just because they publish every week. Right. But there, there's always something. You know. I always bring a bunch of New Yorkers with me when I travel, and I'm traveling right now, so I have a bunch of old New Yorkers in my bag, and I find I go to the short stories first. Um, yeah. I used to go to the cartoons first. <laughs> <laughs> so, not really longer. No, no. Cartoons are going downhill. <laughs> 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 but, you know, they, they, short stories were never... I mean, unless you want to go back to the Saturday Evening Post of the 1930s, they were never really a big popular form. So if they're in a little slight decline now, it, it's just a sort of rolling, you know, kind of path, I think. Don't you agree? Um, Susanna, you mentioned that uh, in Sarah Wakefield's original pamphlet, that you didn't feel like you believed her? Is that something you tried to answer in the book? I imagine the pamphlet was in first person and so is your book. Did, did that, your disbelief of her affect your approach to the, 
her characterization? I, I, I don't think she was lying necessarily, but she was leaving things out because the, the purpose was to in, in, ingratiate herself with um, society and to um, try to amend for the perception of her as a, an Indian's whore, which is what people thought of her, and um, which she had herself occasioned by defending the, the, the Sioux, and even in a way uh, understanding the uprising. So I, I thought her pamphlet was a little disingenuous in that she was um, she was trying to make people um, like her again, mm -hmm. and and also I I felt that her I felt that she had fallen in love with the warrior who captured her and and had never really been treated kindly by a man before. Um, her experience with him, ironically. And she, of course, could never, ever have admitted that in print or even even admitted it in, in person to anyone, or, or to herself, even. So. Questions are the best part. Don't you like questions a lot? Sure. Uh -huh. Since they're both oh, okay. one. one more. Um, you kind of touched upon gender earlier. How constructing Can't hear you. How constructing a male character, um, kind of, you know, the first time, didn't really get a lot of quote unquote male approval. I'm a non-binary person. Today at work we had a pride panel where I talked to people all about gender. And I started reading this book by Claire Dieter of Monsters and mm -hmm. got to thinking a lot about male artists. Mm -hmm. But when I was reading your short stories, um, Miss Lorimore, I felt this really strong sensibility that goes beyond just being female. So I think my question for both of you is how does gender influence your process? Is it something you think about when you're creating? You can go first. <laughs> 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 um, I think I think you would probably agree with me. You so, it's sort of yes and no. Um, there are times when I will make a character a man or a woman because I because gender is part of the subject and I want to approach it from that angle. But sometimes gender is not the subject. The subject is actually something else. The subject is loneliness or illness or betrayal or something that doesn't really, where the gender doesn't matter. And so then it may not be on my mind and I, and I may choose the gender of the, of the characters sort of a little arbitrarily. But sometimes, sometimes the stories are about gender and sometimes they're not. So it's, wouldn't you say that's yes, true? Yes, yes, yes. For you, yeah. I, I'm interested in gender when I'm writing about physical bodies, I think. You know, the difference between men and women. What, you know, what it's, what was it like, for example, and very, very hard to find information. Uh, what was, how did, what happened when, during menstruation, for example, in 1855, what did a woman do? What? How was she perceived? How did she, what did she wear? What did, so in that sense, gender would be important. But I know it's not, it's not something, you know, the other thing about writing is that you can't, it's, it's not um, a writer's job to convince or to proselytize or to even to teach really. Um, it, it, it's not our, it's not what we should be doing. And I find in books where, where the writer is doing that, I, I'm often put off by it. Aren't you a little bit when someone's trying to convince you of an opinion or take a position? It's never a good idea. So, but of course, because gender is of such increased importance because people are more aware of it and 
struggling with understanding it, accepting it, refuting it. Um, it's hard to keep it out of what you write. It will be even harder, don't you think? I mean, it's, it's an issue. Um, in a way that it was not before. It was part I think of the... gender's always been an issue if you choose it, if you choose that as your subject. But if your subject is if your subject is war, if your subject is something else, I meant more an issue uh, for the reader, not for us. Oh, it's, it's on oh, people's oh, oh, minds. Oh, and the gender of the author in relationship to the gender of and the what characters. the author is writing about about gender, men, women. What I think right. it's on the it's on the it's in the air. It's in right. Um. But, right. but we can't I, be affected by it either. That's the other thing, really. Well, we're not, yeah, novels aren't going to really preach or teach, as no, you say. No, cannot. Can and not even really answer questions. They just ask the questions. They try to find interesting questions to ask and then hope to explore, you know, some areas around those questions, but not really land anywhere. Because if you land very hard on an answer to a question, your, your reader's going to recoil because that's a preaching, teaching thing. Um, but you can, as the, as the author, you can have a very strong opinion yourself, but you have to sort of also interrogate that, I think. The questions you ask are much more important than the ones you answer. So, yeah. Also, if a, if a reader is paying attention, he or she is always going to know what hmm. the writer is thinking and feeling pretty much wouldn't you say it's sort of hard to conceal what it is that we believe or it's hard for me yes I, I don't know I don't know I don't know I mean there's a I whole school of criticism reading... that says you can't ever know what the author thinks uh, I know <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming out tonight, spending your evening with us. Um, just a few quick reminders for those of you still with us on the YouTube live stream, you can purchase each of these novels by clicking the link in the live stream description. For those with us here tonight, we have plenty of additional copies available for purchase up at the register where you checked in. As I mentioned earlier, Lori and Suzanne will both be around to sign and personalize books. My coworker, Alexa, is going to point right now to where each of those things are going to be happening. Susanna is going to be over at the Books Are Magic podium to that side, and Lori will be at our lovely little receiving desk on the other side. Um, so we ask that you all kind of line up down the center aisle. It'll be a lot easier once we start clearing off the chairs. Um, please make sure that you grab all of your personal belongings with you. I think that's all. Let's give these wonderful authors one last round of applause.